there's also still this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, see, Rand- can you see? You can't I even bet, see the. I bet Randall would love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would. He would have been. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back. We are on episode 33, I believe, and we're hitting into Galatians. And so we're going to give you a little bit of background. I know we kind of mentioned it on on Sunday as well. We can go a little bit deeper in this context, so I will. But yeah. there's there's basically essentially two different writings, time periods that are theorized or proposed. Right. One is what they would call, if you describe to the North Galatia versus South Galatia, and from what I read and kind of without going deep into the weeds, <laughs> I went more south because I was like, well, south seems to make a little bit more sense, pieces it together, especially when you deal with chapter two, which we will talk about. But chapter two and when Paul is going to Jerusalem and when he's not and all that jazz. Yeah, I think so. it came down to whether you think that, you know, chapter two is relating to the famine relief visit to mm-hmm. Jerusalem or if it's relating to the Jerusalem council. Yeah. And if, if you look at Paul's missionary journeys, then the way that he would have traveled through South Galatia makes more sense with um, the famine relief journey because he wouldn't write this if he hadn't been there before. So yeah. the Jerusalem council would have happened after. Yeah. Before, before 50 AD essentially. And uh, this was one of the other big background pieces to it is this is one of the letters that is huge within the Reformation. And so as Martin Luther and some of the others were looking at all these different types of things and they were reading these things on their own, then they started to see, hey, you know what? These Salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. It wasn't just you know, doing all these works and it wasn't yeah. about what the church was kind of establishing. And so it was very, at least if you go back to their culture and just what was happening there, then you've got a lot of similarities between, you know, these Jewish people, Jewish believers coming in and saying, hey, you guys need to be like us. You need to follow the law. And then the Catholic Church of the day right. or the church yeah. of the day saying you guys need to do these things right, <laughs> in order to be accepted by God. <laughs> yeah. And pay money to have your sins forgiven. And yeah. <laughs> if you want to get into heaven, you got to pay a little bit more money. <laughs> yeah. And not only that, one more thing. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can help your relatives that have gone on before you. One of the first things that we notice that's kind of interesting here is that Paul doesn't actually give, uh, there's, there's not really Thanksgiving. Like there's, there's a little bit of that, but at the same time, normally he's, he's saying something introductory to say, Hey, Paul, I'm a, an apostle of Christ or a slave of Christ. I'm writing to you guys. And, and then he says, I'm, I I praise God. I thank God for you. And so that's not Thanksgiving in this one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That happens in most. And then he's like, no, I'm just going to dive right into it. (laughs) And so he gives thanks. He gives thanks to God, but he doesn't really give thanks for them, which is catches us off a little bit. Yeah. I, well, I think it goes to the seriousness of this letter. Like he's pretty frustrated with Mm -hmm. the Galatian churches after what these guys came in and, and basically changed their whole line of thinking. And he calls it another gospel, you know, in verse six. But I also like how in his introduction, he's defending his apostleship as from from God, not from yeah. man, because that was one of the things that they came in and was like, well, Paul's not really an apostle. He's just sent by the Jerusalem church. Yeah. And so, you know, right out the gate in the very first sentence of this letter, he's like, I am an apostle sent from yeah. God, not from man. Yeah. Not human agency, <laughs> which is kind of funny too, because we're coming off of Corinthians and that was such a big deal as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, that people were coming in and they were kind of giving their own recommendations Mm -hmm. and the super apostles and stuff. Here's, here's why you guys should pay me to hear me. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So Paul's like, no, I just got this stuff from God. And so this is, that's why, (laughs) that's why you should listen. Um, And so, yeah, he, he mentions that he was astonished. He was perplexed. He was really confused as to why they were so quickly deserting the gospel. And uh, one of the things that we're also going to see too, is within this, it doesn't seem like because the Judaizers that were coming in, the people that were coming in were probably Jewish believers. It wasn't like they were just right. Jews that were trying to say, well, you guys. So it wasn't like we need to understand that it wasn't just that they were trying to say Christ is not the Messiah. They acknowledged that and they acknowledged the work of Christ, but they were trying to get them to add on to something. Right. And so we yep. need to distinguish between those two as well. Yeah, it was, you know, like theologically, they were trying to say that you can only be justified into, you know, the promise of Abraham, if you follow the Mosaic law. And so that was like the big theological thing. Ethically, it was that, you know, in order to follow the Mosaic law, you have to, you know, be circumcised, you have to follow the, the food laws and you have to, um, the calendar. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So the holidays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, they were they were adding all of that onto what Paul had already told them. So it was an addition to the gospel, which is essentially a different gospel. Yeah. So we've got that. And then uh, he kind of goes on and he says, you know, he, he starts building his case, as we mentioned on Sunday. And so he's he's saying that one of the things that I didn't necessarily mention, it was kind of in there, but at the same time uh, that they're deserting, deserting a person, the whole idea that you are deserting the one who called you. And so focusing in on that, that one in verse six, the one who called you by the grace of Christ. And so it's not like they're just deserting some sort of concept or, or what have you. I think it's so important to notice because when we talk about salvation in general, we're not saved into a religion. We're not right. saved into a system, so to speak, that we need to understand we're saved by a person for a person. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like the, the crucial aspect to the gospel and kind of what sets it apart as well. Yeah. You know, he'll get into this later, but talking about, you know, where where did you get your spirit from? Was it from, you know, the law or from grace, (laughs) so to speak? So, yeah, I mean, you have the spirit of God living inside of you when you're pulled into this relationship, so to speak. So, yeah, they're definitely deserting that, (laughs) that one. Yeah. And so a little bit later on in in verse seven, he says, not that you are really, or not that there really is another gospel, but that there are some who are disturbing and distorting. And so that whole idea of disturbing, disturbing and distorting is in my thoughts are, that's Satan's favorite tricks in terms of just, man, if he can get us, I would also add distraction. So Mm -hmm. if I were preaching this and we were going through it slower, maybe I would, I would, I would hit on those. You gotta have the three point alliteration. Exactly. (laughs) So disturbing, distorting and distracting. (laughs) And maybe perhaps they're all really the same thing, but yeah, these are Satan's favorite tactics. So if he can, if he can disturb us away from it. And so this would probably be like the things in life that kind of come up. And so now all of a sudden they're worried about something else. They're not worried about loving God. They're not worried about, you know, pursuing God or being even in their freedom in Christ, but now they're, they're disturbed into thinking and kind of perhaps you could say distracted too into something else. Right. And distorting is obviously one of the biggest ones as well. We've talked right. a lot about that as far as if God has given us something good, Satan loves to take it, twist it around, manipulate it into something else and then hand it back and say, well, isn't this even better? Yeah. Yeah. It leads into like, you know, just a, a constant worry, like, man, I'm, I'm never going to be good enough. So am I really even going to be saved in the end? And so, yeah, that is definitely disturbing and distracting and, you know, all the result of a distorted Mm -hmm. gospel. Yeah. Yeah. The anxiety that it it carries. Mm Yeah. Also within this, Paul, when he's building his case and stuff, he's, he's saying that, uh, if, if I come in, even if I came back or even if my, me and my posse kind of came back and Mm -hmm. preached a different gospel, if the angels came and preached a different gospel, which is where he's really like, if you were receiving that, you're really like, seriously, like (laughs) you're telling us don't listen to an angel, but it's kind of like just the impossibility of this is kind of what he's getting at as well. But you know, that let them be a curse, let them be condemned to hell. And one of the things that I also want to mention too is just the fact that I think he's going to play off of this when he's saying, let them be a curse when we get to three and he's saying Christ became a curse for us. Right. And it's also obviously a theme throughout this where there's the curse of the works of the law, basically. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, he says the same thing essentially twice, meaning mm-hmm. that yeah. that's pretty serious. <laughs> like if you're going to come in and teach a different gospel, it's serious. You should not do that. This is a two by four coming at him. Like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, guys, listen, if you didn't get it the first time, let me tell you again, just how serious this yeah. is. Verse eight and verse nine are essentially the same thing, both with a, a warning. And then, you know, I like verse 10 where he's kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not here to seek the approval of men. And that's kind of, I think what some of the Judaizers were, were doing, were saying, you know, Paul's just trying to get your approval because if he says that you know, say that you don't have to really do anything other than believe, then, makes you, you know, it makes popular. you, yeah, right. Yeah. That's, that's popular, but he's not, you know, he said that he wouldn't be a slave, you know, to Christ if he was trying to do that. And we mm-hmm. know that, you know, even in his other epistles that he is very proud of his slave repu- uh, reputation. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he boasts in his, in his weaknesses, uh, so that Christ is strong. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. We kind of alluded to this and mentioned this, but just the fact that this revelation, I, I've been dwelling on this in the sense of, I don't know that I ever really considered just what that meant for Paul. So 
as he's going on and he, as he's kind of saying, he's kind of giving his own history. And so, mm-hmm. you know, he's met by Christ on the road to Damascus, right? And so he spends some time, he spends a few days in Damascus, but then he goes into Arabia and then as it's listed here, and then he goes back to Damascus right. for a while. And then he goes into Jerusalem. He mentions Jerusalem a couple times. And so within all of this, this is one of the things, first of all, that's a little bit hard to reconcile with Acts because depending on the date of the writing of the letter, then that's part of what they're trying to reconcile. Okay, well, when Luke says Paul is moving in this in these ways and this is the order, and then what Paul is saying, we're like, okay, well, at what point did he go to Arabia? And at which points then when he was in Damascus, you know, there's like this yeah, portion in, right. I think it's Acts 13 or whatever, where or a little bit earlier where they're like, wait, so Damascus and Damascus, and they're like, so is it, between these two verses that yeah. Paul's in Arabia, <laughs> and, you know, because Luke doesn't really make it sound like it was completely separate. But anyway, regardless, one of the things that I really like about this or seeing this is when he talks about the revelation being received by God. If he's going into Arabia or something, and obviously his salvation came through revelation, got Christ showing himself. Right. But he's talking about how he has give, been given this revelation. And we're going to see this more. This is not just in Galatians it's that he talks about receiving revelation from God. And so part of our mind goes to if somebody comes up and says, I've got a revelation from God, or especially if they stand up from the pulpit and says, I've got a prophecy, a word from the Lord or something like that. And they're not just talking straight scripture or they're not saying, you know, something from scripture, then you get a little bit hesitant. You get a little bit tense because you're like, okay, well, let's, let's see. Let's see. I'm going to hold off my judgment. Yeah. (laughs) And so my mind goes to this with Paul too. Well, I think what but. really seals the deal with Paul is that, you know, his gospel is not any different from what we have of Jesus' teachings. Yeah. So for it to be the exact same message means that it probably was from God because, yeah. like he says, he persecuted the very ones that later, you know, received him as brothers. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, he had the, the revelation from the from the Holy Spirit yeah. that, um, that you can't deny is essentially what yeah. I'm trying to say. Yeah, and that's kind of what I've been dwelling on is the fact that this had to have been different than what the way that we typically would hear it used today. Yeah. Like when people say, I've got a revelation or God told me to tell you or something like this, this is not the same type of thing that Paul is talking about. He's like, I've, I've been given revelation. And so obviously he's got all this Jewish background. And yeah. one of the things that we also see is that he was set apart by birth. Yeah. And so it's, it's like part of that is... Number one, I see God has had his hand on Paul, much like he's had his hand on us, you know, Mm -hmm. all throughout life. But he's got him for a purpose for the Gentiles. And so even in that revelation, it was part of the purpose and solely for Paul, like in the sense of, okay, well, you're going to take these, this gospel to the, to the Gentiles. You're also going to suffer in these certain ways. And And he said that he didn't ask for any advice from, you know, human beings. He just took the revelation in and just knew that was what his mission was. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I've just been dwelling on the fact that, man, how, how awesome would that be? Um, on the one hand, but then I'm, at the same time, I'm like, I don't know that I would want it to admit <laughs> a lot of the same things that Paul went through, you know, as far as the persecutions and even, and even just how much work he put into it. I mean, it's not even just like the beatings. It's also just the general suffering of saying, you know what, all that it took for Paul to get to the point where he's like, I've learned to be content. You know, mm. in all things, whether hungry, whether thirsty, whether I've had an abundance or not. And that's, those are hard lessons to learn. <laughs> he had the high, high of highs, I think, but he also had low yeah. lows. Yeah. Okay. So we hit chapter two and, uh, Paul is continuing to go on. He says, then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem again with Barnabas and taking Titus along too. So Barnabas was probably one of the, the good Jews. You know, he was even one of the primary ones that, that worked with Paul even mm-hmm. in the beginning. So Barnabas was, was a big figure in, in Paul's life. But then we also have Titus who was kind of like a, a son in the faith for Paul. And we'll see more of that. And I think that's actually when you have a chance to preach, then you'll yeah. hit Titus as well. But Titus was a Gentile, and so you kind of have the two opposites here as far as you've got a Jewish believer and you've got a Gentile believer. And so they Mm -hmm. go up to Jerusalem, and and they meet with them privately. And so I wanted to kind of hang out on just that idea of Mm. meeting with them privately because this is also opposite what he did with Peter later on. Right. And so he's, you know, as not to cause a stir type of idea, but he's meeting with the influential people. And I think he's doing this partly in humility. You know, that's a big motivating factor. Paul's got confidence that he's got a revelation from God. So it's not like, again, it's not like he's going for approval. Right. He's just, although he does say that to make sure that I was not running in vain, but he puts that little thing in there too, or had not run in vain. And it's almost like he's pretty confident that he's not. Yeah. But he also wants to check in. 
and make sure, you know, trusting that what he's got yeah. from God is, is well, legit. Yeah. And the fact that they do end up affirming him helps him understand his calling even more. Like he's more affirmed yeah. that, you know, this is really from God since, you know, they literally spent time with Jesus and, you know, Jesus appeared to me, gave me the revelation, but yeah, now I get to talk with him and, you know, it's all lining up. Yeah. And just to point out once again, that they did not compel Titus mm. to be circumcised, although he was a Greek, it says. And so then in verse four, yeah, the, the matter arose because of the <laughs> false brothers with false pretenses who slipped in unnoticed to spy on our freedom in Christ. <laughs> yeah. So th- I, I think this is interesting because, you know, the, he calls them false brothers. We know that they were probably, you know, Jewish Christians, like we heard talking about. They just didn't have a, uh, a good understanding of, of really what the gospel meant, I think. And so, you know, they slipped in unnoticed because, you know, they thought they were all brothers and, you know, Paul calls them brothers. So they obviously were brothers, but you know, as soon as Paul leaves, that's when they start to slip in the, the unnecessary weight of mm-hmm. the law. And so that's why Paul says they spy on our freedom in Christ, you know, as in like they, they look at it and kind of like figure out how can we, how can we take that out? <laughs> is kind of what I get the picture of it. Uh, to make us slaves is what he is like the ultimate goal of them. And, you know, we'll get into slave versus free. And, um, you know, you kind of talked about mm-hmm. that on Sunday in your sermon, yeah. curse versus yeah. freedom. Well, and I also wonder if part of the idea there is we can kind of get jealous at times when people get something that we don't necessarily sure. have. Yeah. And so if they're spying on the freedom, one of the things that I wonder is, did they perhaps see what the Gentiles were doing? And they're like, man, we've got it so hard. And let's say even that they were called to that because even if they were Jewish and they're like, we want to hold on to this and we can see the value in the law, which we, we may talk about as sure. well. But if they're seeing like, okay, well, your life is easier, or you're more free or something like that, something along those lines, if that is the case, then that would make sense as to why, you know, they're, they're kind of jealous and they're spying on their freedom. And so perhaps yeah. it could be motivated by, we think you're wrong here. And so we want to correct or whatever, misled basically yeah. or something. Or maybe it's just the fact that uh, they could be jealous or something along those lines. But yeah, they slipped in, spied on the freedom, and that's when they lay into them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's it hard goes, to live your whole life where you have followed, you know, a rigid instruction from the Lord. And you believe that, you know, this is the way that it's supposed to be. And then Jesus comes and essentially he replaces that in that you, you know, now get to live by the spirit and we'll get to that, you know, in chapter five. But yeah, so I can see the jealousy. Um, You know, we've had to live by this, you know, set of rules our whole life. And you guys just get to come in and enjoy all the freedom without, you know, any of the burden. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I can think of modern, a little bit more modern day things, let's say. I've known people that they were very hardcore. You cannot play cards. You can't use cards because that's gambling, right? Mm, Yeah. Uh, You can't go to movies because it will be, you know, nobody knows what you're actually going to see. And so you shouldn't go to the movies. Dancing is obviously, you know, there's so many times where dancing goes across the line. So you don't dance. Uh, Drinking, you know, you cannot touch alcohol. You can't be around it because again, either the appearance of evil or you don't really know. And so it's a slippery slope, that type of thing. I mean, you can go on and on about like music and what you can listen to rock, a, a, a rock beat is like completely outlawed. And so there are certain things that as believers, we have said, this is absolutely cannot be a part of it. We should not ever be seen associated with it. And so perhaps that's some a right. little bit more modern of, of what we're dealing with here. Yep. And I can imagine that and I've known people, again, I've known people that have that it is very hard for them to step out of that, even if they do know um, that, yes, this is not addressed specifically in, in the Bible. And so we do have freedom, if you will, to understand that, you know, what the where the Bible puts a line. <laughs> right. We don't if you're even if you back it up several places, <laughs> then, you know, we want to say, OK, well, if the Bible line is here, we back the line up here. And for some people, they might go past what we would put. And so playing with cards, you know, can you play a card game? Can you play solitaire? (laughs) Yeah. But is gambling still wrong? Yes. It's still, you know, so the the Bible says, hey, don't gamble. And dancing, you know, is there a dance that you can honor God with? Yeah. Is there plenty that is completely not God honoring? Yeah. Absolutely. (laughs) And we would say probably most of the time. But yeah, anyway, that's kind of where my thoughts go to. Mm Mm-hmm. 
So one of the things that I also want to mention within this is, so if we have freedom in Christ, and and this is, we've kind of alluded to this in the past, but if we have freedom in Christ, and if he's comparing slave versus free, and, you know, in Christ there's no slave nor free and gen, Jew or Gentile and stuff, mm-hmm. as we're going to see, but what does freedom in Christ look like? And we also would say we are set free from being slaves to sin in order to be slaves of Christ. And so we have this idea of freedom, but then there's also a lot right alongside that. You've got this idea of slavery. Right. And so um, I just wanted to kind of work through that a little bit. I think, I think Romans puts that, puts that really well, you know, where, you know, you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to Christ. And so whatever you are a slave to, you submit to. And Mm -hmm. so if you are a slave to Christ, you're going to submit to Christ and submitting to Christ means that you walk in in step with the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so if you are a slave to sin, that means you walk in step according to your flesh. That's kind of like the way that I, I see this, especially when he uses this, you know, making us slaves to the law Mm -hmm. idea is kind of just the idea of putting unnecessary burdens. We know that the law actually, I mean, we're, we're going to get into this. I know later, but (laughs) the Galatians is like a mini Romans Mm -hmm. where, you know, he talks about how, the purpose of the law was to show that we are are sinful and yeah. that we can't meet God's standard. And so we live our whole lives according to this law to show that we have to have, you know, faith in something else. The law can't save us on its own. It was never meant to. It was meant to point to one that could. We make our, ourselves slave to the one that can, and therefore we are living a life according to the will of God by the Holy spirit that lives inside of us. And, you know, he lists off what that is in Mm -hmm. chapter five, but yeah, I feel like we can't, we can't like leave (laughs) half of the story off. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Even though he, this whole book is like all one thing to me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I tend to think, you know, so we're, we're set free to be a slave is just weird to us. It is not one of those things that that's natural. And so we also, yeah, within the law, like, and this may come up later as well, but within the law, the law, it can, even though Paul is saying, and he's making his whole case on the law is never going to bring you freedom, the law was still there and it was still good. And right. so there is life giving things in it. But at the same time, he's saying it's not giving life. Right. Yeah. And so we have this kind of both and that's there mm-hmm. and uh, trying to figure that out too. Well, is, I think that's why weird. the big question comes up. Well, how do you live according to God's standard if you don't obey the law? And so that is why he goes into, well, you live by the spirit because Mm -hmm. that is the way that God has put himself inside of you so that you can walk according to his ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very simple now, instead of it being 430 or uh, 600 and what is it? 630. I don't even remember. 40. I don't remember the exact number of of laws, but yeah, it's a lot. (laughs) Instead Mm -hmm. of obeying all those, you just have um, these attributes given to you by the Holy Spirit that you get to live by. And yeah, it's a gift. Yeah. I do want to hit verse six. He says, but from those who are influential, whatever they were <laughs> makes no difference to me. God shows no favoritism <laughs> between people. It's kind of like Paul's rolling his eyes here. It's like whatever you want to consider, uh, you know, influential. <laughs> those influential leaders added nothing to my message, uh, the message that he gave, you know, that was from God. And so it, what's interesting to me is just the whole idea of, I mean, I think we've mentioned it before, I, maybe in this context, or maybe I've just had a conversation with other people recently, but the power of influence, and that's what we tend to look to. Right. Whether it's pastors or whether it's other things, I mean, we're looking at reviews. And so, you know, if there's enough reviews, then we're going to follow the influence of the many to show, okay, well, yeah, I'm going to buy this thing or I'm not going to buy this thing or what have you. Uh, you know, this is the popular thing. There's so many things, especially teenage culture. Oh, I'm I like, know. Teen, I'm like, <laughs> do you understand how dumb you sound (laughs) and obviously in their mind it's cool you know that's what you got to do and and yet i know as adults we're not much different it's just maybe perhaps more sophisticated yeah i think about it this way you know in the marketing world now if you want to market something you just get a couple of people with a few million followers on instagram to support your product and that's free marketing yeah and well maybe it's not free it's just good marketing because well and that was the whole thing we i mean the yetis were so popular but then it switched to stanley yeah and it was because because, a couple yeah yeah. utah girls had stanley cups (laughs) in their videos yeah some influential moms and got them together and they said (laughs) and the mom said hey if you make them in these colors Mm. then people will buy them (laughs) 
<laughs> and so they were like, Stanley was like, yeah, we'll make this many colors and we'll send them to you. And they were like, sold. <laughs> yep. And um, uh, now they're all over the place. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think the the important thing to note here is that those who were influential didn't change the message that yeah. Paul was, was preaching. So those that did come to the region of Galatia and spread a distorted gospel were not even sent from those that are influential in Jerusalem. It's one of those things where when you have influence, it doesn't equate to right. And when you have influence, it, I mean, yeah, it's just influence. Maybe perhaps we need to f- focus on the parentheses. Right. Yeah. Of it makes no difference. <laughs> right. You know, because God shows God, no favor to right. them and that type of thing. So, you know, we, we take encouragement from this too as pastors and mm-hmm. um, just in the idea of, you know, we understanding not everybody's going to love you. <laughs> and like Paul, he's like, yeah. hey, I, I understand that there's not going to be people that, you know, you're, I'm not going to look for popularity. I'm just going to be true. I'm not looking for man's approval. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. And so I think that kind of leads into Peter because we get this impression that although Peter was very... Uh, impulsive, I guess, if you will, mm-hmm. and as far as how he responds, it seems like there's also times where he he is he's still got a problem with with being approved by others or being you know accepted by others because of the den- denials. You know, no, I didn't know that man when you know it was going to be the unpopular thing, and then here in this way too, when Paul rebukes him, right? And so the again, just the. You know, hopefully you guys have read it, but if you haven't, the whole idea is here is that Peter was with a bunch of Gentile believers. He was ministering with them. He was uh, eating with them primarily. The, that was the big deal. And But then when Jews came from James, and we can get into that perhaps maybe, but there's from Jerusalem, and they came, and they when, when they came, and they were of the circumcision party basically, like pro-circumcision, then Peter kind of pulled back a little bit, and he also brought a lot of people with him including mm-hmm. Barnabas. And right. so that was, that was the big deal. So Paul rebukes Peter specifically. Um, and he says, Hey, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. You're condemning yourself. I thought the way that he said it here was kind of interesting. If you, although you are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you try to force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's kind of like, he's calling out his hypocrisy. Like, you know, yeah. you, the Gentiles would say, you know, you guys are are weird. I'm going to stay away from you. And so now you're doing the exact same thing. You know, we're going to, you're not like us. We're going to pull away from you. Mm. And so, yeah, how can you even spread a gospel, you know, any good news with people that you're not associating with? Yeah. One of the things that I ran into and in, in trying to look past this, I don't know if you ran into it as well, but some of the early church commentators, if you will, uh, they, were under the impression and they agreed in large part that this was a staged thing that that's so interesting. I did not come across that <laughs> <laughs> That essentially like as they're seeing this and, and I don't know how much firsthand, secondhand, thirdhand information they may have had, but that, you know, because Peter and some of this may go into was the Jerusalem council when Peter and when he met, when Paul met with Peter and they gave him the right hand of fellowship. And then this passage kind of comes right after that. Mm -hmm. And so as Paul's relaying it, then maybe that they set it up and, and the reason behind it was not to deceive or anything like that, or not to try to manipulate, but really it was a matter of Peter knew that he couldn't just all of a sudden change things. But if he had been openly rebuked by Paul and Paul was shown to be correct, like giving the, the correct theology and doctrine, then people would be more apt to then, follow and be accepting of it, so to speak. That's so crazy because some of the things that I was reading were talking about how they put more emphasis on Peter and John and James, the brother Mm -hmm. or half brother of Jesus, you know, because they were there with Jesus and that Paul was just some guy that, you know, said he had a revelation. Yeah. (laughs) So that is interesting. So So I don't, I mean, when I was looking at it and stuff, of course, I don't necessarily buy into it just because I'm like, as it flows and as it reads, and if you didn't know that, then you can still understand what's going on here. And not only that, but just the fact that it's so strong and the way that Paul puts it. I mean, if Paul is writing this and he's the one that actually confronted him, then I would think that he would not really relay it in the same way if it was staged, perhaps. Sure. (laughs) Or something like that. Maybe it was for those particular people. But anyway... I mean, the whole letter is kind of intense. So, yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. for something to, yeah, I don't know. 
Well, and if even that wasn't just, real, why would you be so intense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of other things that I keep thinking about as far as like why I, I don't really buy into that type of idea. Um, but yeah, anyway, it was, I just thought it was interesting to, to look at it and <laughs> yeah, consider it. And, an interesting perspective for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think, I think ultimately when it comes down to it, Peter was in the wrong and Paul does rebuke him and Paul does remind him. And I think actually, you know, it goes to show that there are times where we need to be reminded of the same things. And and that's kind of where I was going with this past Sunday was just the idea that I know for myself, I have to keep being reminded of the fact that I'm following Christ and the gospel has power, not just for salvation, but it's actually power in the sanctification. It's power in becoming like Christ. And that is what we, de- we are dependent upon mm-hmm. because we tend to be comfortable with depending on Christ for salvation. We get used to that. And that's a pretty easy thing because we run into it and we're like, oh, I can't do this by myself. I get that. I see that. Yeah. But then we feel like, okay, well, but it's upon, it's dependent upon me to actually, you know, grow in Christ and it's dependent upon me to do this because we look at it and we're like, well, yeah, we can see how we can run from God. We can see mm-hmm. how we can be apart. So we feel like because we can run from God and because we can make decisions that put up barriers or obstacles in our relationship with God, we also feel like we're responsible for tearing them down and for moving, working in such a way that our desires change or what have you. Yeah. I do want to hit again, just that whole idea of being crucified with Christ, Mm. because that's one of the passages that we pull out of Galatians and we just kind of have outside of, yeah, outside (laughs) of context. (laughs) And we're like, oh yeah, that's really good. Yeah. I've been crucified with Christ too. And so it's no longer me, but Christ that lives in me. But I think that that's really what we're talking about here. So understanding that if we are crucified with Christ, we are dead. Right. (laughs) And so our personhood is dead in a sense and the slavery is dead. And now, of course, again, we know that that we still have our own agency, if you will, but that it is Christ living in us. And that's the goal, if you will, that Christ is living in us and through us. And that is what's motivating. And, And I would just say... I'm convicted by that because I don't live like that often. I think, you know, I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking like, what do I need to do, you know, today? And my first thought is not necessarily like, God, I see you're there. (laughs) Yeah. You are the one I'm dependent (laughs) upon. This day is dependent upon you type idea. Like that's not always my, the forefront of my mind. Yeah. I think it, yeah, I relate to that too. Um, And it may just be that this is the, the kind of like culture that we live in. Everybody else is kind of like, you know, I worry about me and, you know, I get up and, you know, I take care of my family and make sure that everybody's good. And then, you know, I, I'm in control of the day, but really, yeah, looking to God in every moment for dependence is hard Mm -hmm. to be constantly reminded that, you know, if you are crucified with Christ, then you really are, you are, you are dead. And so what lives inside of you now is, you know, the spirit, and that is going to help you become the image of God that he intended, which Christ was fully the image of God. So when we say, you know, we want to be like Christ, we're restoring the image that God had initially created uh, when he created man. Yeah. Yeah. So, And this phrase, I live because of the faithfulness of the son of God in verse uh, 20, that's one of those things where, you know, depending on the translation, it's just simply the faith of Christ or faith in Christ. And so, uh, that can be taken so many different ways in terms of, mm. so is it actually Christ's faithfulness that we are living by, or is it by our faith to Christ and just the nuance within that? And yeah. I would say, well, number one, we know it's both. Like right. Ultimately, we know it's both. <laughs> but perhaps, again, we, we tend to focus more on my faith to Christ and mm. maybe not so much on the faithfulness of Christ and being in all of that and And depending upon and knowing that, yes, in the same way that we have been saved by faith alone in Christ alone, that, that our job to overcome the things that we feel like need to be overcome is in the power of God. It's in the power of Christ. This actually, the same wording happens in uh, Romans three, I think, where, you know, he's talking about how, you know, all have sinned and fallen short, but it's through the faithfulness of Christ Mm -hmm. that we can you know, be reconciled back to God essentially. So yeah, I think you're right. We do put a lot of emphasis on our own faith in, in Christ, but Mm -hmm. yeah, there's something to be said about, uh, his own faith to the will of the father. Yeah. For our reconciliation. So, yeah. And that changes my perspective in terms of my prayers. You know, I've for, I don't know how long it's been, but 
there's a lot of times where my prayers have changed from, you know, God help me to do this type of thing to I need the desire first, <laughs> like change yeah. the desires and changing the desires for God, changing the desires towards uh, whatever it may be. And so that the rest of it kind of follows suit. So chapter three, he gets into it and he says, you foolish Galatians <laughs> who bewitched you. Jesus was portrayed as crucified. This is one of the reasons why we believe that these people were saved, that they, it wasn't like this was a justification thing. Like, you know, you guys aren't saved, but he did believe that they were saved. The people that were coming in were, were saved. And so it's a matter of how do we then live according to our salvation? Right. So he asked a question, did you receive the spirit by doing the works of the law mm -hmm. or by believing what you heard? And that's, everybody should know the right answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, because, you know, even the Jews that had been living according to the law, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. You received the Holy Spirit because you believed with your whole heart, the gospel, you know, they saw Christ crucified, they were convicted and they you know, believed, you know, this is actually where I can put my faith and my trust now. That's why he's so adamant about calling them foolish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because a couple different times. Yeah, yeah. You know, you guys know that this is not how you were, you were saved. And like in verse three, he says, although you began with the spirit, are you now trying mm -hmm. to finish by human effort? He's saying you, you do have the spirit. So mm -hmm. why try to, you know, live by the flesh? Like you can't yeah. do this in your own, you know, human effort is what he's kind of saying. So uh, then he goes on to the, this, you know, whole thing about um, Abraham. And I love how he uses Abraham as the basis of, you know, righteousness and justification by faith mm -hmm. alone, because Abraham didn't have the Mosaic covenant or yeah, the Mosaic yeah. law. So yeah. they, he had only what God had told him and it was all by faith that he was walking with the Lord. And so, mm -hmm. you know, he says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. That is all Abraham had to do. If you, you know, he believed what God said was true and that was enough. Mm -hmm. And so um, why is that not, not enough for you guys now is essentially what Paul is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just keep yeah. going back to it as far as that whole idea of uh, how do we believe that sanctification works and is it by our own will and way and power or are we depending upon the spirit and do we actually trust that the spirit is going to work? And so Yes, we will eventually, you know, if you will, mm -hmm. like, so let's just kind of speculate a little bit, but if we're looking at ourselves or looking at other people and we're saying, okay, well, you know, there's not love, there's not joy, there's not patience, patience and, and so on and so forth. And so if, if we're getting there and that's kind of what we're hoping for, are we looking for them to somehow be convinced or something like that? Well, all that happens, but at the same time, uh, what is the root cause and what's the root motivation? And I think if we're pursuing the person then that, I think we perhaps don't give enough weight to that is kind of what I'm getting at. That I've been convicted at least recently in terms and, and through Galatians that I may look to what I'm supposed to do for approval or various mm. things like that instead of looking to the person saying, I trust you, God, too, in terms of changing me. And I think part of when we put our focus on God and not on the law, then that helps things to be in the right order, if right. you will. So instead of being fools. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, and along with what you said with Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We, we see that too in mm -hmm. uh, Hebrews. And it's one of those things where we are sons of Abraham by faith and not by biology. Right. And it says that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. That is part of what Abraham believed. Proclaim mm -hmm. the gospel to Abraham ahead of time. And so that all nations will be blessed through you. And there's just this whole case that he is making here and that those are cursed of, of those who are under the law because we have to abide by the complete yeah. law. I like um, the, how they, they translate it um, for all who rely yeah. on doing it. Like that's yeah. where you put your hope and your trust. You're under a curse. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Because you can't keep doing the law. Like you physically cannot do it all. <laughs> yeah. It was meant to show you that you can't do it all. Well, and again, I would point out the fact that like, even if like, we can't even get the desire to do all the law. Yeah. Like we look at all the different things that God would say, and there is always going to be some where we come to the fact and we say, I don't want to. Yep. I think of Psalm 119, you know, where the whole, I mean, it's 176 verses of, you know, Lord, I love your law and, mm. you know, help me to do it. And the very last verse is... I've wandered like a lost, like a lost sheep. Hmm. Seek your servant. Like 
I cannot do this <laughs> on my own is essentially what the whole message of Psalm 119 is. Like I desire to do this, but I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And like, so even in that, I see the faith that, you know, God, you have to do something supernatural in me to be able to do this law. I can't mm -hmm. do it on my own. So yeah. yeah, that's kind of what I think of when it says, um, you know, where he pulls curses, everyone who does not keep on doing everything written in the book of the law because you can't. And so yeah. he says, you know, the righteous will live by faith. What about this idea of Christ becoming a curse for us? Like curse of the... I should have looked where curses everyone who hangs on a tree comes from, but I did not. It's one of those times where a lot of times when you have Old Testament quotes, it's one of those things where like you, you look at it and you look at the context that they're using it and you're like, I would never have gotten that. I know, yeah. And so you trust the Holy Spirit <laughs> and inspiration yeah. of, of these writers and stuff and, and saying, okay, well, yeah, we're putting these pieces together. Well, yeah, but, so obviously, <laughs> so, you know, when you read, you know, essentially, Christ was a curse. Yeah, I think essentially it was basically, it's not, he's not cursed because of anything other than the, the hanging is demonstrating the curse. Right, yep. So like when you're condemned and that is your condemnation and that is your uh, verdict, then that's the idea there that curses anyone who hangs on a tree. Well, it's, it's kind of like anyone who hangs on a tree has been condemned. Yeah. Like we see the condemnation of it. You know, it makes me think of just how Christ took on our sin and, you know, yeah. our sin is, is part of the curse. Um, so that's why, you know, the law is essentially cursed because it shows us our sin and, you know, we can't do it on our own. It doesn't bring life. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Christ took on death which is the result of the curse so that we can have life and he conquered death. And so he reigns over the curse so that there is freedom now. So the second half of this is that not only did Christ redeem us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, but he says in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles and we would receive the promise of the spirit by faith. I think we need to do some more thinking, I guess, is what it comes down yeah. to. And maybe it's just me, but I uh, need to do some more thinking on what that means as far as the spirit being a down payment and being a guarantee. We say, yes, we have the spirit living inside of us and we see that as, okay, well, he is the one who gives the power to do the right thing and he's the one that convicts us to do the right thing or what have you. We, again, still kind of go along with the whole idea of the spirit. We, we focus on the spirit's power to be able to do works mm -hmm. and... Yes, there is part of that within up up earlier in chapter three where he says, you know, the spirit work miracles yeah, and stuff. Right. Yep. And so there is definitely that aspect and, and we're not denying that. But I think we sometimes perhaps give more weight to that when we to the to the neglect of the spirit being in us, being the down payment and being the assurance and being, you know, the presence of God or understanding the presence of God, that that is fulfilling mm -hmm. instead of, you know, again, as Americans, perhaps we're doers <laughs> and maybe we need to, maybe we need to rest a little bit more in being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think about it too, just in the fact that if I didn't have the Holy spirit, what, what would my even, what my works even amount to? And mm -hmm. so, yeah, the fact that, you know, I can trust in God sanctifying me, you know, throughout the rest of my life, eventually, you know, taking that to completion I, I see the spirit as, I mean, it really is like the seal, like mm -hmm. it's going to help me um, be able to do this. And it's not because of anything that I can do on my own. It's just that the Holy Spirit and out of God's grace and his kindness and his mercy that we can, you know, live by the spirit and, and be able to have this sanctification process. Mm -hmm. And so I like that salvation is twofold. One, you're declared righteous just in standing and then two, that you are going to become in the image of Christ. Yeah. One of the things that we noticed that I love that Paul points it out down in verse 16 of chapter three, he says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his descendant. And he says, mm. scripture doesn't say into the descendants. Yeah. He's, he's preaching. Saying, referring to the many, he says, <laughs> and to your descendant, referring right. to, the, to one. the one. Yeah. To one. There it is. That who one is Christ. I like that. You know, he says, you know, the law, it came 430 years after this whole covenant with Abraham. So this law does not cancel the covenant that was previously ratified by God for if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on the promise. And so you have, you know, like this dichotomy that you kind of talked about yeah. uh, on Sunday, you have, you know, you have the law and you have the promise and God graciously gave uh, Abraham 
the promise. And so it's the same with us, with Christ. God graciously gave us salvation through Christ. And mm. so there's no more having to live by the law in our human effort. And just the whole idea of the promise superseding, like we, we, when we look at this, we understand that the promise is the trump over mm -hmm. the, the law, so to speak, that the law was given not because that's how, you know, we were supposed to get right with God or anything within right. that, but that the law was given as grace, but it was within the grace of the promise. And so that's kind of where, where it boils down to. This will kind of lead into chapter four as well. So as we get in towards the end of chapter three, we're going to have to kind of move into chapter four a little bit too, and we'll kind of go yeah. on for next week. But <laughs> anyway, the, the whole idea of the law being the intermediary, so it was administered by angels, and then he goes on to say that it was also serving as a guardian or a custodian. Yeah. And so I think that's probably what we'll kind of pick up next time First. too. But why was the law given? One, it showed us our sin. Um, showed us, uh, you know, what God's standard really was mm -hmm. and that we can't meet it. <laughs> and uh, three, it showed us that our, our our need for that descendant so that, you know, someone could come and help, you know, essentially rescue us from the bondage of, you know, we'll never be able to do this on our own. So we need someone to come help us. Yeah. I do like, too, that, you know, he, he says, you know, hypothetically, what if a law had been uh, able to give us life, mm -hmm. then there would be, you know, no need for <laughs> a, a savior. But it didn't. The scripture imprisoned everything under sin. That's what it says in verse 22, um, so that the promise could be given. And there it is again, because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ yeah. to those who believe. He's really emphasizing Jesus' faithfulness yeah. to the mission. Yeah, and the the other aspect of why was the law given, he starts off in verse 23, uh, held in custody under the law. Mm. And so this guardian aspect, this custodian aspect of of the law that it was keeping, you know, it was one of the graces that God had to keep Israelite pure, like, or keep Israel pure, and as much as possible, like, keeping them separate from the rest of the world. Um, and yet he also turns around and he says, but now, you know, in Christ, that, Yes, we are set apart and we are holy, but we're also among all people. There's neither Jew nor Greek, or right. slave or free. And so, again, there's this freedom in Christ and there's this uniting in Christ and to our true purpose, into our true family. Yeah, I think when I think of guardian, I think of someone that watches over, but also you could think of someone that that's like actually guarding something. And, you know, so to keep you guys safe, this is you know, your guardian. And so I think really what it, like what you were saying, I think it kind of comes more into play when we get into chapter four and sure. following where he says, you know, it was there because, you know, those descendants of Abraham and, and Jesus coming through and then us as being part of the heirs of Christ, you know, along with him, then he says, now I mean that the heir in chapter four, verse one, as long as he is a minor is no different from a slave. And so it's this idea that the guardian, the custodian until essentially your babysitter <laughs> until... Right you come to full maturity and that full maturity is actually when you are in Christ and when Christ has come and faith and, and all. And so to a certain extent, perhaps we could look at the law and say, well, you know, the law was there for when we were elementary. Yeah. <laughs> and right. the law was there before we understood the law was there until, you know, we came into a fullness. And so even within that freedom, it, I guess perhaps it could be likened to becoming an adult and, and understanding that now we have freedom when we're right. out from under our parents, when we're out from under the custodian, the guardian, then now we have more freedom to actually understand what life is all about. Right. I guess that kind of gets into chapter four. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll pause there to say next time when we come in, we'll pick up with those ideas of being an adult in Christ, if you will, mm -hmm. <laughs> and heirs of the promise as opposed to returning to the law. So. We'll see you guys next time.